Welcome to Walk in the Spirit, an expository teaching of God's Word. Walk in the Spirit is the audio outreach ministry of Pocatello Baptist Church. It is our prayer and desire that with the help of this message, we all will learn to walk in the Spirit. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he whereof, thinketh hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as of touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you right now. And Lord, we ask that you would just be with us, Lord. Lord, be with us as we uh, open your word, Lord, and instruct our hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, if there are any minds here that are wandering, myself included, Lord, that you would focus us now, Lord. Just give us a a clear mind, Lord, and clear ears to hear your word, Lord. Lord, let us not always look, Lord, with eyes that would think that we have the answers, Lord, but help us to understand the words that you will write and you will speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray for your spirit to be upon this place, Lord, and upon your servant. I pray that you would remove, Lord Father, your servant now and allow your spirit to teach. Lord, I just thank you for this time. We pray all these things in your Holy Son, Jesus Christ's name, our Lord and Savior and God. Amen. Have you ever ignored a warning sign? I don't know if you've ever ignored a warning sign. Uh, I I will have to admit that uh, I've ignored several warning signs in my lifetime. Only because I'm a man, right? And we don't read instructions on how to do things. We just open the box and we know automatically what's supposed to happen. But... uh, so I have ignored a few warning signs in my lifetime. Um, one in particular, I remember, you know, I, I, you all know I'm a pretty big coffee drinker. I love coffee. And coffee is supposed to be hot, and it says on the cups that coffee is hot. But I didn't expect it to be boiling. And so uh, one time I, I was thirsty for coffee. I hadn't, coffee, hadn't had coffee in hours. And so I took my coffee, and, and I put it up to my lips, and I just took a, a big swig. Normally I can handle something like that. I, you know, scalded my mouth enough times that it's pretty, pretty dead and numb to, to heat like that. But this time, the, the water was so hot that it literally just, I mean, hurt for hours. I couldn't even drink, couldn't, couldn't finish my coffee, which was a big shame, right? But I, I couldn't drink coffee, I couldn't drink anything, let alone eat anything for hours because of the, the, the heat and the intensity of it. We must remember that warnings are there for a reason and pay attention to them. Give you an example of that. The U.S. Naval Institute proceeding, that's the magazine for the Naval Institute, uh, takes different articles from different uh, seamen. One in particular, Frank Couch, one, one time wrote this illustration about uh, taking warnings when they come. Two battleships had been assigned to a tra- from a training squadron and had been sent out on sea manu- maneuvers during heavy weather. And for several days, they were, they were serving, uh, he was serving on the lead battleship and was on watch at the bri- on the bridge as night fell. And the captain himself actually stayed on bridge because the weather was so uh, dangerous and the fog was so patchy. Shortly after dark, the lookout on the wing reported a light bearing on the starboard side, starboard bow, I guess that should sound like a seaman, right? On the starboard bow. It is a, and the captain replied, is it steady or moving astern? Lookout replied, steady, captain, which meant we're on a dangerous collision course with that ship. So the captain then told the signalman, signal that ship, we are on a collision course, advise you change course 20 degrees. Back came the signal, advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. The captain said, send, I am a captain, change course 20 degrees. To which the reply came back, I am a seaman, second class, you had better change your course 20 degrees. By that time, the captain was pretty furious and he sped out these words, send, I am a battleship, change course 20 degrees. The simple reply came back, I am a lighthouse. Frank says they changed course. 
Now, imagine if that captain had only let his pride and his arrogance and what he thought he was and what his understanding was get in the way of listening to the warning. He would have, been, he would have caused the death of not only himself, but most likely every man aboard that ship, or if not severely maimed, at least. But the captain heeded the warning sign and as such was able to avoid the dangerous situation. Far too often in our own lives, though, we are given warnings, be it through Scripture, through the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, we are given warnings, and we ignore them. We go on because we think, well, we're too strong to fall. I have victory in this area. I am overcome in this area, and there's no way that I would stumble into this matter. This morning, we're going to look at three warnings together. And next week, we're going to look at three evidences, if you would, in opposition to our three warnings that we're going to look at this morning. But let's just begin in verse 1 of our text this morning. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Rejoice in the Lord. I want to start here because this is the foundation for all that we will ever speak about, or really in all honesty, in particular what we'll speak about this morning. Why? Because if we make the Lord our joy, and not the things of the world this morning our joy, then we will be able to get not only receive instruction from the Lord, but to hear, heed the warnings from the Lord and instruct and change course if we need to because of those things. But when we make the things of this world our joy, we, rec- we don't recognize the warnings oftentimes that the Lord will give us. Which is why Paul says these words. Paul says, after that, he says, I write the same things to you. Meaning what? I'm writing to you again the things that you've heard before. And to me, this is not grievous. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a labor for me to have to do this. But for you, it is safe. In other words, I want to keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again so you finally get it. So that you can start to correct your course, if you would. So you can start to pay attention to what is important here. But so often, we will hear something one time, and the minute we start to hear it again, what do we do? Click. Oh, I already heard this before like watching a rerun on TV. Unless it's your favorite show, you're probably not going to watch it. You know, I've seen this one before. Well, the truth of the matter is, is oftentimes when it comes to the Word of God and the instructions from the Word of God and the the different teachings that we may sit under and hear, we need to not just go automatically, oh, I know that. I know that already. And so we tune it out. We need to come, and that's why you heard me pray in particular, we need to come with open ears that we might get instructed by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So this morning, we're going to look at three warnings that honestly, if the church would not have ever, or if the church would have heeded, we wouldn't be dealing with some of the issues we deal with today as we look at these three warnings. The first one we're going to run into, let's just read verses two together. It says this, Beware of dogs, Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Beware of dogs. That's our first warning this morning, if you would. Beware of dogs. I have to say, this is one of, those, this is one of the reasons why I find it so strange that the young people nowadays like to throw around the idea of, what up, dog? I mean, obviously you've never read the scripture, because what we're going to discover this morning is that is not an affectionate term. I know it's supposed to mean your homies, your whatever, whatever the case may be. But the truth of the matter is, when you say that, um, it, it, you don't understand uh, from a biblical standpoint what you're really calling somebody. We're warned of dogs. But what does it mean? Well, it speaks simply of false prophets, or like, if you would, the, like Pharisees, who would lead people astray for their own perversions or for their own reasons. That's what the term dog really means. Unless you think I'm, I'm making that up, turn to me the prophet Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, when you get there, look at verse 8 with me if you would. And we'll just read through the end of the chapter there. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 8. The prophet Isaiah writes these words. He says, <clears throat> The Lord which gathered the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. Now, we're talking about a little bit of a Messianic prophecy. We're going to talk about the Pharisees a little bit here and the false prophets at the same time. And we have, All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand they all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. 
Come ye, ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and I will, we will fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. So what does it say there? It says that the dogs are those that are what? They're dumb dogs. They're ignorant. They would, they'd rather sleep and slumber, be lazy, if I could put it to you that way. And they're greedy dogs. They can never get enough. They always want more. That's the description of what a dog is. So when the apostle tells us, you know, in, in, in the book of Philippians, beware of dogs, I have no doubt that he was thinking about this text. Those who are what? Those who are slumberous, those who, those who are lazy, those who, who, who are just about themselves, and, and also those who are also very greedy. In other words, the dog is one who uses the church for gain and teaches and shall continue the same, uh, to, to continue on the same um, and honestly, what oftentimes they'll teach is they'll teach things like that we need to just continue, because look at how it said on that, on that end day, tomorrow shall be the same as this day and much more abundant. What is one of the things they're going to teach? Uh, that it's going to continue on the same way it's always continued on. That it's always going to be the same. Today will be the same as tomorrow, and tomorrow will be the same, day is the day, same as the day after that, so on and so forth. If you would, it's those in the church nowadays who are not teaching the Lord's return. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, what I mean is this. They act like God is not coming back. They act like Jesus is not coming back. If you would, turn with me to first, first, or Second Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. They do this for gain. They're after themselves, after their own selves, if you would. 2 Peter chapter 3 gives us another warning about these same types, if you would. 2 Peter chapter 3, pick it up at verse 2 and read through verse 9 together now. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant, uh, ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which were, are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men." But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand days, and a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, we know there is a, there's a movement, and I, I hate to say in, but I will, but in the Christian, modern evangelical Christian church, there's a movement now, there's a, there's a group of people who are starting to preach that, God, that Christ is not really returning. He's not really coming back. That uh, we misunderstood the scriptures when it told us he would. There are those who will teach that, well, just continue on the same way you're continuing on. You know, don't worry about your life, just, you know, be the way you want to be. Understand the Lord is coming. And every moment, moment that the Lord does not return is the mercy of the Lord. And notice there at the end of that, in verse 9, in verse nine he says this, what he says, that, that, that not count as some men count slackness, slackness excuse me, but is long-suffering toward us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you understand? I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. I think to myself all the time, Lord, now would be a great day. I'm ready. Let's go right? I mean, I do. That thought crosses my mind more often than not. But the truth of the matter is, is God is showing mercy to me by not coming. I know that doesn't sound, that sounds strange, right? Because I trust, I know, I know I am 100% saved. I have no doubts that I'm going to heaven. I, there's no doubts who my Savior is. I have no doubts that I'm on my way to heaven. But it's still a mercy of God to me for him not to come. Why? Because there are people in my life who are not saved. Even potentially people in my life who I might judge as saved who are not yet. And the Lord is being merciful to me by not coming. See, the problem is that we start to think so much about ourselves and what this means to us. But the truth of the matter is God's thinking of you too. God's thinking of you too. 
It's one of the reasons why you have confidence in the fact that the Lord is going to come back. But I will be honest with you, I want the Lord to come back when the Lord gets everybody in the kingdom who's going to be in the kingdom. I don't want him to come back before that moment. Now, you all know that I am not a big end-time preacher, meaning I don't get into all the things that are going to happen after the church is removed and the Spirit of God is no longer here in the millennial reign. When we get to it in the text, we'll talk about it. But I'm not a big, like, uh, all-the-time prophecy kind of buff guy. Because I remember as I read passages like this where it says in the end times that scoffers will come, mockers, and so on and so forth. I remember that one of the biggest uh, areas of scriptures that we get uh, the idea of the rapture from, from, from Thessalonians, Paul wrote that to them because they thought they missed it. So do you realize that they were seeing the same type of characters that we see nowadays? And we go, well, now must be the time. Now, yet there are some things that have been fulfilled that couldn't have been fulfilled before and are fulfilled now. But the truth of the matter is, is it may not be in your lifetime. That's why I'm not all, all about, let's talk about the end. Let's see what's going to happen in the end. Let's figure out what that's going to look like. Because I'll be honest with you, I know I'm not going to be here when God comes back to judge this world. I'm not worried about it. What I am worried about and what I am focused on is now. And what I mean by that is this. Am I being faithful to my Savior now? And I want to be, as our Lord instructs us in Matthew chapter 24, let's just read there, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verses 44 through 51. I want to be this type of character. Matthew chapter 24, verses 44 through 51. And, you know, one of the reasons why I am passionate about that, guys, and I want to be honest with you, is I have watched, I, I, I grew up in a ministry that was all about the end times and the prophecy, and look what's happening, God's going to come back any day now, and, you know, and, I mean, that was back before we had the 99 reasons why God was going to return in 99, and the 101 reasons why he was going to return in 2001, you know, I mean, before all those books were written, I had preachers that I was sitting under who were all about the end times, and we're so close, and it's going to happen any day now, and so I watched people come to the Lord, or, or come into the church, and come into faith, I believe a faith, I'll believe a saving faith of the Lord, who now have gone astray. Why? Because where was the Lord's return? That preacher told me, it's going to be any day now, and it's been 12 years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever the case may be, and he's still not here. That's why I'm a big, I'm not really a big guy about that, because the truth of the matter is, if I scare somebody into the kingdom of God because of the Lord's return, or at least into the church, they can be taken out when he doesn't show up on their time, right? That's why I'm about, what, is, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Read these verses with me if you would. Matthew chapter 24, verses 44 through 51. Therefore be ye also ready, for such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. <laughs> who then is a faithful and wise servant? Who is the lo who his Lord hath made ruler, who, excuse me, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him rule over all his goods. But, and if the yet evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to be honest with you. I want to be one that when my Lord returns, finds me so doing. I want to be faithful to him when he shows up, no matter when that is. I want to be walking with him when he shows up, no matter what's going on. I don't want to be one who gets all, uh, all fired up about, well, the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming, and then lose faith, and then the Lord didn't show up in my time, so now I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to live any way I want to, because it doesn't really matter, does it? Notice what he said there, and we can recognize those who are going to be like this. How can we recognize that? He says this, he describes them, if you would, kind of like the dogs, right? Even our Lord describes them here, saying what? They're going to take advantage of the servants, they're going to smite them, and they'll be given, and they'll be given over to the lust of their own flesh. Men of, men of God, and I use that term very, very loosely at this point, but men of God who are about themselves. Men of God who stand before you in pulpits and they tell you how wonderful life can be and how beautiful it is just to walk with the Lord. I agree, it is beautiful to walk with the Lord, but the truth of the matter is, sometimes we've got to teach the whole scripture, don't we? Because there's also suffering promised to us. Do you understand that? 
There's also difficulties that are promised to us. Does that mean that we lose our joy in the midst of diff- the trials? No. But the truth of the matter is, is that we have to understand that it's not all peaches and cream. I don't even like peaches. And I'm, I, I'm discovering I think I might be lactose intolerant, so that doesn't appeal to me at all. Right? But the truth of the matter is, is it's not like that, is it? What's the other, what's the other one? Not, not all roses, right? I don't know what the word, I don't know. One of, those, one of those analogies you guys want to use, pick your own, right? But it's not all just fun and games. There, that's one I know. <laughs> all right? It's not all just fun and games. And the, unfortunately, the church has turned into, the modern evangelical church, for the most part, has turned into a place of fun and games. Now, don't get me wrong, I love fellowship just as much as you guys. Tonight at our church picnic, we're going to have a great time at fellowship. We're going we're gonna to eat, we're going we're, we're gonna to eat, and we'll probably eat a little more. And then we're going to get up and maybe attempt to play some games. You know, um, we have horseshoes, we'll have ladder golf, we'll have beanbag toss, there'll be all sorts of sport balls out there or anything like that. I mean, we'll have playing cards for those you want to play playing, car- playing cards, whatever, pinochle, whatever the case may be. All right, we're going to have all that stuff out there. It'll be a great time of fellowship. We're going to have the Word of God there too. And we're going to have singing there too. See, because life is not, I mean, it's fine. Fellowship is great and having a good time together is fine, but that's not what it's all about. And here's the problem. There are so many churches nowadays that you can go into and it feels like all you went to was a party on a Sunday morning. I mean, even the music is loud. (laughs) I'm not trying to make fun of their music, but the truth of the matter is, if I can't even hear myself singing, I know I don't want to hear myself singing because I don't sing well, but I should at least be able to hear it in my own head, shouldn't I? But when I'm in a place that's so loud I can't even hear my own voice, There's a problem. Now, the first warning we have there is that we should beware of the dogs. The dogs. Here's one other thing I've noticed about dogs. And I've watched this with my own dog, Buddy. Buddy is a faithful dog to us and he loves us. But my father moved in with us. My father carries dog treats in his pocket. You want who Buddy loves more right now? It's not us. All right? When the treats are gone, he'll return to us. But as long as my dad has treats in his pocket, Buddy's following my dad. And the truth of the matter is, is that there are people who are like that in the churches, men of God who are like that, who they love. They love the ones that are giving them the treats, giving them the accolades, giving them the pats on the back and say, look how wonderful you are. That's the, ones that, that's the dogs, if I can put it to you that way. So the first morning we run into our scriptures here this morning is to beware of the dogs. Now, I want to say this before I move on to our next one. Go ahead and turn back to our text. Before I move on to our next group, I want to say this. Not necessarily is every one of these attributes individual. Sometimes they'll actually carry on all three of what we're going to look at this morning in the same human. So, I believe one builds upon another and leads to another, if I could put it to you that way. But the next warning we get is this. So we get beware of dogs. The next warning we get is beware of evil workers. Beware of evil workers. Um, we know what evil is. You know what the literal translation for evil is, guys? If we were to put it in a different, in a different word? Worthless. Of no value whatsoever. And evil is of no value, isn't it? Matter of fact, it takes things of value and makes them worthless. That's what it does. But the other word we run into there is workers, which can be translated or, or the idea of either a laborer or a teacher. Either way. So beware of evil workers. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4 when you get there. What do these evil teachers look like? What do they, what do they sound like? How will you recognize them? Very simple. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, we could go through a lot in this text. And we see there the time's going to come. I believe the time is now, as it has been for a while. That people will turn away from truth. Why will people turn away from truth? Well, I'll tell you the problem with truth. Truth challenges you, doesn't it? 
Let's be honest. Truth challenges you. We sat at the table with my son this morning. My son knows that he's always going to be a sermon illustration at some point. We sat at the table this morning with my son, and we were talking about reading the Bible. And uh, he confessed to us he hadn't been reading it as much as he should have been. And uh, I asked him, well, where is your Bible? Uh, I don't know. Now, I'm going to give my son a little grace because my son's brain, not making fun of him, but he, 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 had, he, he got a little bit of the beta brain that my wife has, which kind of be forgetting a little bit, right? And I should say, I, he comes by naturally for me too, because if you've ever seen me, sometimes I'll walk in, turn around, walk out, because I can't remember why I came down here. All right? But the truth of the matter is, is my son, I said, where's your Bible? I, I, I don't know. I said, where's your phone? Right here. Right? I'm like, where's your wallet? Right here in my pocket. And so I pointed out to him, I said, you know what you value is what you have, and you know where it's at, don't you? And so the truth of the matter was, I pointed out how he wasn't really in this and valuing this. Because he didn't know where it was at. How many of you on Sunday mornings have to search for your Bible? I'm not, I don't want to show hands. Right? But how many of you on Sunday morning, or how many of you know right where it is because you put it right, where, right there when you get home on Sunday morning? after church and leave it there until next Sunday morning. So you never have to worry about finding it because I never use it. I mean, the truth of the matter is is we're going to turn away from the sound doctrine and there is only one sound doctrine, guys, and understand that. That's right here. It's right here. But look what they turn to instead there at the end of verse, the end of verse 4. It says what? They shall be turned unto fables. We all know what a fable is. It's a tell. It's a story, isn't it? Now, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to sermon illustrations, obviously. I use them, <laughs> okay? But I have turned on the radio sometimes to listen to somebody or, or perhaps somebody sent me a link to a sermon they wanted me to listen to or something like that. And so I turn it on and I listen for as long as I possibly can. But I'll be honest with you, unless I hear that man turning the pages of the Bible and getting people into the Word of God, I lose interest very quickly. Because there are men who they'll open up their Bible to read the text that they're supposedly going to be covering, and then I get an hour, or maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, because they don't want to go too long, of stories. Stories. Never is the Word of God injected into those stories. There is the principle there. Why, where are you getting that from? Why are you telling me that story? What does it have to do with what we're talking about? Teach me. That was your instructions for a pastor. Teach, right? We talked about that last week. Act to teach. Teach me. Open the word. But so many will just listen and listen to stories for hours on end. And there's, uh, there's a lot of churches nowadays that honestly, that's what you get when you go there. You get a good storyteller. You know? And maybe he's animated. He makes you laugh a lot or whatever the case may be. And that's great. But the truth of the matter is, and I want to be honest with you guys, if you ever get to the point where you feel like all I'm doing is telling you stories, but I'm not opening the word of God, get rid of me. I give you 100% permission right now. Get rid of me. Because the minute I start to turn away from this into my own ideas, I am now an apostate. And you need to get rid of me. I'm not honoring God. I don't need to hear your stories unless somehow the application of the story you're about to tell me is going to somehow teach me and instruct me in the Word of God. And the Word of God should be the focus of the message. It shouldn't be the side note. Stories should be a dish, a side dish, right? This is the meat. This is what should really be there. But so many get that out of order. This is the side dish. Matter of fact, sometimes it's the, either the before dinner appetizer or the after dinner mint. And they think the dinner is their stories. I'm really afraid of this group that we would call the evil workers. Because I believe, I mean, notice they do work, don't they? They do labor. They do do stuff. That didn't sound right, but anyway. They, they do stuff in the church. They are working. They're doing stuff. But I'm afraid they're going to find themselves in that same class of people that we read about in Matthew chapter 7. And I'm not going to make you turn there into this time. You're familiar with the passage of Matthew chapter 7, verses 20 through 22. We read these words. It says this. It says, Every tree, tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then these sad, all too sad words. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Like an evil worker, right? Lord, Lord, did I not do many wonderful works in your name? Didn't I cast out devils in your name? I mean, I was there. I was invited to the White House. I shared with the, with the president. I prayed, prayed over the Congress. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys. You guys know that a, the, a week or two ago, I got the opportunity. They invited me to come down to the Pocatello City Council and, and open their meeting in prayer. And I praised God for the opportunity because I'm going to tell you what I prayed. I prayed the Word of God. Literally, I read passages from the Bible in the prayer because I wanted to hear what God instructs about leaders. Now, I'm not lifting myself up as something special, but I've also heard men who have opened other sessions of prayer and in and, and congressional meetings, even in our state house, house of representatives. I've been up there for that. And you know what? I have, an, I have a hard time. Matter of fact, the couple times I've been there, I've asked myself, I wonder if they're a believer. What faith are they from? Who is their God? I held big outreaches. Thousands upon thousands of people came and filled Angel Stadium. And I'm not making fun of that, man. Understand me. I appreciate his ministry, but the truth of the matter is, is what are you doing with them afterwards? Are you instructing them in the Word of God, or are you just letting them flounder? So, second, we need to be, a, be, uh, be aware, be wary of evil workers. Back in our text now. Maybe you're still there. I can't remember. Back in our text now, Philippians chapter 3. Let's look at our third group this morning. The third group that the apostle gives us a warning about is one that uh, I have to admit I- I've seen and, and I feel like it's a thorn in my side and the thorn of the Lord's side, I should say more so, than the other two groups. The other two groups are a little easier to identify. But this third group that we run into is beware of the concision. Beware of concision. So what is concision? Well, literally put, There are two ways of looking at this, and we're going to look at both. But simply stated, concision means a cutting away. That's what it simply means, a cutting away. Which is why the Apostle Paul goes on to verse 3 and says, For we are the the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. So we're going to talk about that group as well, but I want to talk about a different group for just a moment here, if you would. Because the concision could be those that are just cutting away at the church. Those who are just pulling and cutting away at the work of God. Those who are pulling away and cutting away at the word of God. Well, we don't pay attention to that text. I have actually heard of teachers of the word of God who ignore the Old Testament entirely. Why? Well, because we're a New Testament church. That's all that matters to us is the New Testament. Really? Well, how do you handle things when Paul says that all the things that happened aforetime, speaking of uh, in the book of Hebrews, all the things that happened before, they were there for our example. What things are he talking about? The entire Old Testament. How do you ignore that if you're a New Testament Christian? See, they'll cut away even at the Word of God. Or they'll get together in committees and they'll try to decide what really was the Word and what really wasn't the Word. Well, let's just cut it all out. Right? Get down to the book of John, about one page long. I mean, they'll just cut away, and they'll cut away, and they'll continue to cut away at it. Why? Because, well, I don't like what this verse says, and this challenges my life, and this makes me have to conform to the image of Jesus Christ, and I don't want to do that, so I'm going to take that out of my Bible. That one doesn't matter anymore. I'm going to ignore things that don't matter. Teachings that are, that are vital to the Word of God, that are written plain, English, plain black and white for you right there. But we're going to ignore those things. Also, this group would cut away at the body of Christ. What do I mean by that? Those that would cause division. Turn with me to um, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Pick it up at verse 17 when you get there. We'll read verses 17 and 18. They cut away at the body. Now, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which caused division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Notice what he says there, avoid them. Avoid them. 
Now, we've all met, witnessed ministries that are a mile wide and an inch deep. But I don't, and I don't want to cause offense here, but here's the one thing that's interesting to me about those ministries like that. Those that avoid, uh, if you would, that cause divisions and those that, that, uh, that uh, aren't serving our Lord but serving their own lust. They want to grow a big ministry so they can name it after themselves. They want to grow a big church. This is the church of so-and-so. This is my church. I was joking around with Robin on Wednesday night. She got up behind the pulpit and she's like, this is my church. If you don't like it, get out. I said, we got several issues right there, sister. First of all, I use the word sister. <laughs> Second of all, it's not your church. It's not my church. It's no one's church but the Lord Jesus Christ's church. We, we were having a good time. I mean, I know she was joking around. We are having fun. But the truth of the matter is, guys, that there are ministries who act that way, aren't there? There are ministries that will treat you like this is my work. And if you don't like my work, then get the heck out. You're not welcome here anymore if you don't agree with me. Wow. Can you imagine that? I wonder how many people would throw the G Jesus Christ out because he doesn't agree with them anymore. Oh, did you really mean that when you said that, Lord? Again, they're cutting away, aren't they? And they cause division in the body. Remember, there's also the second way. Uh, there's, the, there, there's the second way of the circumcision, if I, if I could see this way, of the, of the cutting away. Those who would be saved by the outward appearances, not the inward transformation. Now, I'm not saying they're saved. And we're going to take a, a look at uh, next week a little more about the outward showing of faith. But I do want to say this. There will always be Judaizers in the church. You know what a Judaizer is? It's someone who judges you based off of what you look like, appear like, act like, do, speak, whatever the case may be. There's going to be Judaizers. They can't read your heart. They have no clue. I'm going to be honest with you. Now, you know your heart, and you know what the Spirit of God is telling you. So if you're being a rebel because you just want to be a rebel, then that's sin. If you're not conforming, you're not doing something the Lord is impressing upon your heart just because you want to be able to stick it to the man, so to speak, that's your problem. That's sin. And God's going to deal with you on that. But in all honesty, if you've gotten to a place where it's not necessarily an issue for you yet, God hasn't dealt with that yet, Let's just pick an example here for, for a second if we can, right? Let's just talk about smoking, for example. I don't know how many of you smoke in here. I don't want to know, all right? Let's just talk about smoking in here, for example. Well, maybe the Lord hasn't really pricked your heart yet about the, the dangers or, or the, the reason why he doesn't want you to smoke. So, you know what? I'm not telling you go smoke. I'm just telling you that he hasn't gotten there yet. That's okay. But what kind of guy or what kind of man of God, what kind of brother in Christ am I going to be if all I do is look at you like, well, you must be going to hell because you have a cigarette in your mouth. You know what that makes me? Self-righteous, arrogant, and prideful. Guess where I'm going? I mean, in all honesty, isn't that the truth? Now, I could come to you and I say, I really don't think you should smoke, and here's why. Not only is it really bad for you, and it's going to kill you, but it also doesn't represent freedom from sin. It doesn't represent our Lord. You're going to have a hard time witnessing. I'll be honest with you guys. Here's the truth of the matter, all right? If you saw me stand outside the church here after service smoking, many of you would leave. Because you're like, well, what's that all about? And then I would have a hard time witnessing to certain people if they saw me smoking too, wouldn't I? I'd have a hard time being out on the streets. If, if I go, hard, hard time, I'd go down to this neighborhood down here, start trying to share the word of God with them, and they saw me standing out here smoking every day. You know how many of them would probably listen to me? Very few. Does that mean that, sin, that smoking is a sin that's going to send you to hell? No. Any sin is going to send you to hell. Right? Without the grace of God. But here's the problem. I don't know. I'm getting off track there. I apologize. We'll always have Judaizers. And they, they are those who would try to put you under the bondage of the law again. And now when I say that, I want you to understand that we as Christians should be given to commandments and the law. I'm not going to say we don't have things we should be doing. But understand there's a difference between us doing them because of our love for the Lord or us doing them to keep ourselves in, saved, if I can put it to you that way, or if you would, to uh, keep the law for salvation. Remember what Paul said to the Galatians. Turn to me to Galatians chapter 3. Let's just read it yourself. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. 
the Lord writing, or the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Galatia says these words. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And I'm going to be honest with you, there's a group, there's a, there's a teaching out there in the church right now that is teaching that in essence you should be perfected in the flesh. If you are a saved believer, then your flesh will be perfect. I should be able to tell that. I should be able to see how perfect you are by your flesh. Matter of fact, if you, if you sin, if you struggle with sin, then there's a good chance that you don't actually don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you need to uh, come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess you need to get saved every Sunday morning. I don't know what the idea is. But the truth of the matter is, there's a teaching out there that says that. But notice what he says here. He says, what? Are you begun in the Spirit, now you've been made perfect in the flesh? Are you thinking now somehow you're going to save yourself by your flesh? When in reality, the first thing you heard was what? You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Well, that's where salvation lies, and that's where it ends, period. It doesn't lie, and it doesn't go anywhere beyond that point. That's where salvation is at, faith alone, Christ alone, grace of God alone. But they are not, they, they are the concision, right? They are of the concision. Here we have the Paul warning them about this. But I want to look back up into this passage. And notice he called them foolish Galatians. And I think that's interesting because I hope you remember in the last passage we read, it said in Romans chapter, chapter 16, verse 18, that they would what? Deceive the hearts of the simple. So if you're getting deceived by men like this, I hate to tell you this, but you're simple. Or as Paul would call you, you're a fool. Here we go. Back up now in our text. Go back up into verse, chapter 2 of Galatians, of Galatians. Chapter 2. Pick up verse 16 with me if you would. Let's see how Paul really expounds on this idea. Chapter 2, verse 16 through verse 21. says these words. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. And not by works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now I want to pause right there for one moment. There is no work that you can do that will justify you and make you, if I could put it to you this way, savable or worth saving in the eyes of Jesus. There is nothing you can do. It's what's been done for you. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now I want to pause there for a second. This is what he's saying to you. You'll remember that when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, we, became a, we, we should have become a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away, right? The, in other words, what? They're dead. They're destroyed. They're gone. But now I'm going to do what? I'm going to build back up all those things I did before. Maybe not all the sinful things, but all the righteous things in my eyes. I'm going to build those things back up before. Why? So that I can be justified before God. Because God, now that you've cleansed me, I can make myself even better. No. <laughs> you can't. And there's, there's, I'm not lying to you guys. When I tell you there is a ministry, that there are several ministries out there that are teaching, and even our own community, that are teaching that you get saved, and then you what? Then you begin to justify your salvation through your works. How well do you do Christianity, for lack of better terms? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. They're no different than our LDS neighbors. That's exactly what our LDS neighbors say. They say that Jesus bought the way. Now we have to finish the path. Well, if I teach you anything except for salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, then I am a heretic. And I should not be listened to. So, we see the concision here. If I build again those things. And then let's continue on in our passage. Here we go. But what if I, or verse 18, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Dang, I just failed again. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now listen to these words. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if the righteousness come by the law, then Christ 
died in vain. I want you to understand that word frustrate simply means to set aside. So if I set aside the grace of God, is what he's kind of saying there, if I set aside the grace of God and righteousness could come by the law, then Christ had no reason to die. He had no reason to die. Because if we, in our own flesh, in our own works, could somehow make ourselves worthy, then Christ didn't need to die. So, the concision will come, and they'll tell you, you must not be saved because you have sin. <laughs> and you struggle. And uh, they like to point at themselves, I don't struggle with that anymore. I've overcome that. Not realizing that the minute they say, I don't struggle with that, they're admitting in themselves that they have pride because they're using the word I. I, I, don't, I, I, I struggle with everything. If there's something that I've overcome, it's not I who have overcome it, as Paul said, right? But Christ who overcame it. Because it's Christ who's living in me. It's not me. I want Christ to live. I wake up every morning. I'm like, Lord, I need your help today. Because I'll be just as cursed and just, just, just as uh, base the person I was before I came to know you, Lord, if it wasn't for your spirit. I need your spirit to reside in me today. I need you to overflow me with your spirit today. I need you to live through me today. Remember these words from the Apostle James. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point is guilty of all. Also, he in instructing us about the works of our righteousness said thus, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. What is, it, what, what is he really saying there? He's saying this, It's not the flesh what makes one, makes one righteous, but the righteous will show forth through the flesh if they let the Spirit live in them and let Christ live through them. But those of the concision will judge your salvation on the flesh, not recognizing the heart. And I will close with these, all, this all too familiar passage from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, where it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that, not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. You see, God has even set the work before us that we should walk in it. But our refusal to walk in the work that God has set before us does not mean we're not saved. We may not receive the blessings and the joy and the, and the comfort and the peace that we should have in the Spirit. But we can never get there by the flesh. So third, we need to be aware of the concision. Next week, we'll look at if, if I could put it to you this way, the antidote to falling in with the dogs, with the evil workers, with the concision. Thank you for studying God's Word with us on Walk in the Spirit. To hear more of this or other portions of Scripture, please visit www.pocatellobaptistchurch.com or you can write us at 190 West Chapel Road, Pocatello, Idaho, 83201. If you live in or are visiting Southeast Idaho, we would like to have you join us here at Pocatello Baptist Church for any of our services. Our service times begin with Sunday school at 9 a.m., Sunday worship at 10 a.m., and Sunday evening evening study at 5 p.m. We have a midweek study and prayer service for both adults and youth on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Child care is available for all of our services. For more information or directions, please call us at 208-237-4915. Until next time, God bless you as you walk in the Spirit.